I'm going ice fishing tomorrow night. Join me. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, let's do this. Hey, we're so glad you're here. My name is Pastor Kim. And if you're wondering why you're here, I am not going ice fishing. Don't worry, I, I'm there. But uh, here's what we're doing. We are going through the book of Acts, but we're doing more than book of Acts because we will be done with Acts next week. And you go, well, then what are we doing? We're going to carry it on a little bit because the idea here wasn't just to go through the book of Acts. It was to find out how we became the church we're at, you know, how we did this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit with uh, the destruction of Jerusalem because how many know that had a huge impact on Judaism, you know, when they all got kicked out. We'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about the persecution that started against the church because that's the huge split. That will happen. They started to kill Christians, so Jews were very huge on saying Christians are not Jews. That was probably the final split there with that. And then we're going to talk a, a little bit, probably a couple weeks, on um, what happened to the disciples and where we got. We've been talking about where Paul wrote his books, but Peter wrote his and John wrote his. So we'll just figure out even Revelation, where that book came from. Okay, we're not going to dive in and explain it all, but so we're probably going to go, even when we end with Acts, we're probably going to go about four more weeks on explaining some of that. Sound good? Yeah. Even if it does sound good, that's what I'm doing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whether you show up for it, I guess that's another opinion, okay? And um, we do have note sheets there. If anybody wants some note sheets, you can follow along. If you have any questions throughout the night, feel free to wave a hand. We'll come to you. We do come to you with a microphone for one purpose. We are recording, and you just we can't hear you. I can hear you, but the recording can't pick you up. So we will come to that. But feel free to ask questions, and I'll try to pause. And anybody have any there, you know, for going through that. Let's pray. God, you're an awesome God. We thank you for who you are. We just ask, Lord, just open up our eyes and minds. Just receive something from you, we ask in your great name. Amen. Amen. Uh, just, uh, we are in Acts chapter 27. If you have a Bible, you can follow there. If you don't have a Bible, some are on the round tables. You can pick one up there. Uh, just real quick, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem. He had three trials. The first trial was by a guy named Ananias, which is an illegal trial, and they just started beating him up. Second trial was in front of a guy named Felix. Felix is a crook. He's a rip-off artist. And um, can someone get a Bible back there if they're at that one there <laughs> and help out? Thank you for helping out with that. If anybody needs a Bible, Wes will get you a Bible, okay? They're in the back ones, actually, at the back round table. I should have moved them up. Anyway, uh, Felix... He's a crook. He takes bribes all over. Anybody need a Bible, just hold up. We'll get one to you. Wes here will get one to you. And then um, who came up after him was a, a person named Festus. Festus came up after him. Uh, Festus is trying to clean up the mess that Felix left for him. Okay? So he's working on doing that. And he would have let Paul go. In that trial, but Paul appealed for Caesar. And if you remember last week, the other person that was in this trial was a King Herod, and we talked on being a Christ rejecter. Herod knew everything going on, and he still said, I don't want anything to do with it. And so he and his sister Bernice walked out. So what we have here is a man, uh, Festus, is going to send Paul up to Rome because he appealed to Rome. He takes one of his royal uh, generals, whatever, leaders in the army. His name is Justice, or Julius, and said, take him. Take him up there. Uh, Paul has one guy that travels with him. Um, I can't pronounce the name. I'm not even going to attempt it. There it is behind me. And he also takes Luke. Luke is still traveling with him. And Luke is the author of Acts. And remember, you can find this out. Luke joins him and doesn't join him, and joins him, and leaves him, and joins him a third time. And so when you're reading Acts, this is what it will say. It'll say, Paul went here, and then it will say, we went, and then it'll say, Paul went. When it says, we, Luke's with him. When it just says, Paul, he's not. Okay, so he just kind of joins him, doesn't join him there. 
And so they're setting sail, and he is on his way. Paul is going to encounter his fourth shipwreck. This is the fourth time he went down. His ships get a sink. Okay? In Corinthians, he says, I suffered three, and Corinthians was written before this. So this is number four. He's going down. Uh, Luke doesn't even mention. <laughs> when you're writing a, a biography of a guy and don't even mention three shipwrecks, you're wondering, not even a mention of them. If I am on a ship and it springs, I, I was on my boat and the plug fell out. I have told that story 55 times, you know, <laughs> that the plug fell out. It, it's just who I am. I can't believe Luke doesn't even mention the other three shipwrecks. Not even a mention of them. But he makes up for it because he makes a whole chapter of the fourth one. He gives us a lot of details of the fourth one. All right? Another thing is Paul talks in Timothy about people that have shipwrecked their faith. Where do you think he got that wording from? Three shipwrecks when he wrote Timothy. He said they've shipwrecked their faith because of situations. Paul's Faith is never shipwrecked, but he is continually shipwrecked himself. Which brings an interesting question. I'm just going to bounce this out to you. If I shipwreck three times, who's going on a fourth ship? <laughs> if you shipwreck once, who's going on a second ship? You know, you're on a cruise ship and it barely escaped with your life. You're, you're in those little boats floating through the Mediterranean. How many are never doing a cruise again? Okay. I'm researching anxiety and fear. We're, we're talking the whole year on being fearless, so I figure now we're in October, it's finally good to look up fear <laughs> and see exactly what it means and things. Do you know what? Our mind, you go, why would you even get on a ship? Our mind is literally triggered. We've heard this before, but our mind is triggered, fight or flight. How many have ever heard that term? Fight or flight. Guess which one is the majority, what we're really triggered for? Flight, right? No, fight. You know, our mind is triggered for fight. And fear works on the flight. This is why, and some of these lines you may have heard, if you almost drowned, it's a good thing to go back into the water right away. Because if you don't go back into the water, your mind will literally work on a flight thing, and you'll never go back into water. If you fall off a bike and, like, break a leg, it's probably a good idea to get back on the bike. Or you spend a whole summer not riding your bike. That's just off the top of my head what could happen. <laughs> if you're new here, I broke my leg a year ago, and I haven't ridden my bike much this year. <laughs> you know, I, my wife with my broken leg should have thrown me right back on the bike and said, keep going, you know, push, push me down the hill, get me on. You can do this yet, you know, training wheels and all. But we are wired for that. But fear puts that other thing. It's a chemical that's literally released in our mind with the fight or flight. And like I said, I'm just exploring this. We'll go deeper into it. But that's where a lot of anxiety, here's the illustration, the woman that was writing it, she hates small spots. She, you know, claustrophobic, she hates small spots. And so literally, she has to take small steps to be able to do this. She has to take that step into it to conquer the anxiety that she will go on an elevator, but she has to look at the little hole at the top of the elevator that there is an escape out of here. Now, I don't know if I'd ever want to use that hole, but she has to do it. She even went on a gondola. Not a gondola. What, what am I thinking? That cable car that goes up. Probably just cable car would be another name to use for that, right? <laughs> probably a better word, cable car. Now, how many know, to me, a cable car is a little scarier than an elevator. But she says, literally, everything, the flight comes up because she deals with anxiety. But she says, I have to take these small baby steps and, and continue to focus. Now, this isn't even necessarily Christian thought process, but it is her process of battling anxiety. You have to step into your fear. And she said, when you do it, it creates, cr releases an enzyme in our mind to battle the anxiety because our minds are literally made to fight but we continually flight. And, she, and the answer was, this was an answer for why anxiety is growing so much, because we created a generation that flights instead of fight. Interesting theory. I'll get deeper into it. So why is Paul going for his fourth shipwreck? 
because he actually stepped on another ship after he had a shipwreck. I'm stepping into this. I'm going to see what happens. Interesting thing, I don't know. I don't have a lot of answers. I can open it up for questions. I'm just starting to explore this. But we, can we admit this? Anxiety is growing in our society today. There's a lot more anxious people than ever before. You know, it, it seems to be stirring up, and they deal with this type of thing. We, we flight much easier than we fight. And so how do you start the fight? And it's not man up. It's small steps. So I think that's why Paul got on another ship. That's why he went. Not that he knew anxiety and things like that, but boom. All right? So chapter 27. When the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius. In this day and age, there is no such thing as a passenger ship. They do not exist. Passenger ships do not exist. Okay? And so if you're going somewhere, it would be like our barges, if anybody's ever been up to Duluth, the big barges that go in and out of Duluth, you would get passage on one of those barges. You pay, would you take me? Because there is no cruise ships. There's no big ships. You just say, I need passage on this. The ships that they had at this time, the biggest ships were Alexandrian grain ships. They were cruising all over the place, okay? Uh, we have some uh, drawings of one, and actually they discovered one off the Ephesus shore and have redone it. It was in the, that's one of the ships. That thing is over 2,000 years old. That's an Alexandrian grain ship. So it would have been something like that, and we'll come back to this. So it would have been uh, a couple things to point out here on the ship. If you look on your left, the thing sticking up, that is the God. Every ship is dedicated to a God. And they would sacrifice to that God before they set sail. So the God would be happy with them. Okay? So they all have their God. And then they all tow a smaller ship. Because most of these would be going to Rome. But Rome had a shallow harbor at the time. And so what they had to do is they brought the ship as close as they could. And then they take all the the bags that were on this ship and put them on this ship because the smaller ship could go to shore. The bigger ships couldn't make it to shore, so the smaller ones would go to shore. So most of the ships would be pulling a ship like that behind them of different sizes. And some of these ships were huge. The one that was found in, Alexand or in Ephesus actually isn't that big. Uh, probably the, the bigger ones would hold about 600 passengers. Plus grain. Why was grain so important? Rome had become the biggest city in the world. The biggest city in the world. The problem is Rome is in the middle of seven hills. It's built on seven hills. How many know hills are not great for f crops? And so in what they could bring to Rome would last them four months. So they have to supply food for the other eight months. They have to import food. The greatest granaries were in Egypt. And so these Alexandrian ships would come sailing uh, three to 400 tons they'd be able to do. Uh, Rome needed about 2,100 ships a year to stay afloat, to feed their people. Okay? This is just to give you some idea of what's going on here. I know this is like, why do we even care? This is what Rome's doing. We have to import this. These ships have to, because we're going to see Paul is going to sail when it's not good weather. Why would he sail when it's not good weather? Rome needs food. You can't do it. In fact, in the year, I wrote down the year here. It will come to you in a second. Uh, yeah, the year 39. There it is. I knew I could find it. The year 39 had two straight years of horrible storms, so ships didn't sail, sail in the winter. Rome went through incredible famine. The people were starving because no ships sailed. So this guy named Caligula came up with this ingenious idea. He said, I will guarantee the money. If your ship doesn't make it here, I will still pay you for your cargo. Please come. That is something we call today insurance. Caligula came up with the idea. Isn't that awesome? A Roman Caesar came up with insurance. 
and Geico is now born. Okay, so there we go. He, he's got this idea. I will pay you. So these guys know if I can get there and drop it off, I'll get paid. If I sink, I'll still get paid. But if I can get there and drop it off, what does that give me time to do? If I can get there and drop off my load faster, what does it give me time to do? Help me out. Haul another one. If I sit in a harbor for three months, what is that costing me? Ka-ching, ka-ching. If I set sail and sink and I still get paid, no loss. I'm still getting paid. If I make it and can dump it off, I can go back and get another load and come back again. There's only one minor detail to a thing like that. If your ship sinks, you got to live. Okay, <laughs> you got to live through it. <laughs> minor detail. All you got to do is live through it and you'll be a rich man. Okay, and so these guys are willing to take that risk because we sit there and go, why would they sail? That's why they're sailing. Rome needs it. They're paying big bucks for food and they're guaranteeing it because a couple years before this, they had a huge famine because no grain was getting in. So that's where we're at, all right? Rome wants food. This thing is a medium. This ship is a medium Alexandrian ship. It's not one of the big ones that will hold 600. This, this one has uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 276 people on it. So it's about half as big, 276 people, all right? So how are they sailing? We got a map. Love our maps. They're bouncing along the shore. It's that yellow line on there. They're bouncing along the shore because they're afraid to shoot across because to shoot across, you need a bigger boat. If anybody's ever fished on bigger water, you need a bigger boat on bigger water. And so they bounce along the shore. So they're jumping from shore to shore. They're there, and they're going to make a crew. They're, they're going to shoot it. They're, we can make it. The weather's good. We're going for it. All right? So the ship wants to sail. Where the red line's going now, they're going to run into a 14-day storm, and they are going to shipwreck. I'm giving away the end of the story. They're going to shipwreck. So there's the storm. It's going to blow them around. It's exactly how it blew them, too. And they're going to end up in that little island called Malta. All right? So I gave away the end of the story already. You guys got this. They're setting sail. Sound good? Any questions about that? Rome needs grain. He said, I'm getting paid whether I make it or not. We're going for it. Because if I make it, then we can make it back. And I can make more ka -ching. So it's all about the money. All right? So, oh, yeah, the date. They said it was after the fast. The date that they set sail, the day after the fast, in the year, we're in the year 59, October 5th. So we are just about on an anniversary here. This is October 5th. This story starts October 5th. Okay? Actually, it starts the 6th. They, say, they set sail the day after the fast. All right? And so they're, they're setting off. Uh, verse 10, Paul says this. Men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, danger to our lives as well. People are going to die. Why does Paul say that? One of two reasons. One is God told him. Two is I've shipwrecked three times. I'm not, this looks bad. <laughs> okay, I know what it is to shipwreck. One of those two reasons, Paul goes up to him. Paul is a prisoner on a ship. So now we have the captain of the ship and the head of the guard over him. And then Paul, a prisoner says, I think it's going to go bad. Which, who would listen to him? Can you imagine being on a cruise ship? You're walking up to the captain of the ship. Can I see the captain? We need to turn around. I sense it's going to go bad. Can you imagine the captain go, well, thanks, Kim, for warning us. Turn it around. <laughs> you know, we're not stopping at any port. Sorry, people. Kim said it could go bad for us. Okay? So we go and sit there. Well, that captain was an idiot. What captain would listen to Kim on the cruise ship? Okay? And if he would listen to me, I went off that cruise ship anyway if he's listening to anybody else. The captain says, no way. It's all good. But, verse 11, but the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed partner, harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, further up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor and only southwest and northwest exposure. 
all of them said, man, there's a really nice place for sailors to spend a month. Can you imagine what kind of place that is if sailors want to spend a month here? We don't want to live in Osseo if we can spend a month in the cities. That's basically what we're saying. If you live in Osseo, we love Osseo. I would love to spend a month in Osseo, but not on this time. Okay? So, verse 13. A light wind started blowing from the south, and the sailors thought they could make it, so they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. So they're at that little island. They're bouncing around there. This is day one. But the weather changed. They didn't make it one day out before the storm hit. They didn't make it one single day. Okay, they're like, we can do this. The first day out, a storm blows. Just a horrible thing. And the first thing they do in day one is that little boat that's behind them, they pull it and bring it on shore. They don't want that boat flapping all over and hitting the side of their boat. You don't want two boats hitting. Can you get that? You don't want two boats hitting each other. So the first thing they do is they pull the little boat and bring it on shore, on, on, shore, on top of the boat. They pull it up. So now they got a boat on top of a boat and 276 guys in a sea. So as I say this story, imagine this whole story. We're going like this, okay? It's going like this. That has got to be a, a unique feeling. Now, I've been on my boat on bad water, okay, going like that. We were on a cruise once, my wife and I. I'm talking lots about cruising. And there was a bad storm on the Mediterranean right where this storm happened. We plowed through it. It was just us and 3,000 others, you know, on a, on a huge ship that was 18 feet tall. We, we were risking our lives. We had, we had a window. Jenny, you can help me out with this. We had a window that overlooked the ocean. I figured, oh, yeah, I'll just get a really nice place. We walked into our room, and they had this metal thing over our window. And I asked him, I go, what's that metal thing for? He goes, well, the waves could break the window, and if they break the window, no more Buckman's. <laughs> holy cow so they said if the window breaks this will still save your lives and I'm like are we going toward a storm yeah and I go do you hit these storms much and he said this is the first time we've ever had to use those <laughs> wow yeah. it was the first time they used them we got excited because I know the story of Paul I know we're in the exact water that this happened seriously we are cruising through the exact same water we're going from Rome the other way. He's headed to Rome. We're leaving Rome, cruising across. I know this story. And I'm like, Jenny, this is awesome. I'm excited about the possibilities. You know, God's going to use us to bring revival somewhere when we survive this thing. It added a unique flavor to the trip. Let's just say that. Okay? One day out, first day, they bring the boat on. And they don't even have metal things to put over the windows. They're just shooting it, okay? So there they are. Day two, the Bible says, they, they went out, verse 18, day two. The next day, a gale force winds continued to batter the ship. Remember, we're going like this. The crew began throwing the cargo overboard. Okay, so the first day, they bring the ship on. The second day, they're bailing, and they can't keep up bailing. Here's something. Whatever kind of cargo they were doing. I guarantee it was grain or rice. Neither one of those handle well when they're wet. They would have expanded and shattered the boat, so they're bailing the grain. We don't care anymore. Why would they throw that over so fast? They still get paid. We don't care. <laughs> this is insured. You know, the original Geico has started. They're shoveling the grain over the side. They're trying to lighten the boat, make it lighter, okay? The following day, verse 19, the following day, this is day three, the following day, they um, threw over the ship's gear and threw it over. So they're still sinking. Everything to steer the boat and stuff, they're getting rid of. How many know that's desperate to get rid of the steering? That would be like throwing your, you know, your cars out of control so you throw the steering wheel out the window. We got to lighten this boat, <laughs> you know, lighten the car. I don't need the steering wheel. That's gone. So now it's just one boat on top of another boat that's empty with 276 guys on it. And then it says, they hadn't seen it and they gave up all hope. That's day three. They're going to be in this storm for 14 days. 
Day three, they're giving up all hope. When you toss away your ability to steer, that's giving up something. And now, boom, fear and panic. Talk about fear and panic can come on some people. Hopeless, they gave up all hope. And they're just going. All right? Any questions about that so far? We good with the story? Why do you think Paul doesn't lose hope? Remember, the boat's going like this. And one thing we're going to discover in just a minute, Paul keeps having what we call quiet time. He keeps praying every day. Well, I'd be praying too. But Paul's praying in faith. What's the difference between Paul and the other people? Paul knows the stories of Jesus. Jesus was on the Sea of Galilee, and a horrible storm came. And a bunch of fishermen that were with him, called his disciples, lost all hope. And they said, we're going to die now. Okay, this is in Mark chapter 40, or 4, verse 40. Mark 4, 40. His disciples who are fishermen say, we're going to die. Jesus gets up, looks at the storm, rebukes it. It goes quiet. It goes quiet. And then what does he say to his disciples? Anybody know this story? What does he do to his disciples? He goes, we're good, guys. High fives them. Do you still have no faith? I knew it. I know it's back there. I was just seeing who was looking at me and who was reading. <laughs> it's right there. This, this is the way I give tests. You should not flunk this test. <laughs> I was just about to do that. What does it say? I know it's behind me. He rebukes their faith. They're in a horrible storm. The ship's going like this. Jesus gets them out of it. And what's the thing he says? Where was your faith to believe I'd get you out of this? We can sit there and laugh at them, but guys, in reality, how many of us fail in this way? As soon as there's a storm in our life, where are you, God? Don't you see what's happening? And what's God? You know, well, he loves us, he comes. But sometimes it's just like, come on, man. I, I, I said we're going over and you go, well, why the storm? Why, why the whole thing? Let me tell you, God always uses the storms in our lives, people. He doesn't cause the storms, but he uses the storms. He can use the storms. Corinthians says this. Is there anything God cannot turn around for his glory? Is there anything God cannot turn around for his glory? Why was this such an awesome thing? Well, we know that Jesus was on a ship, and it was a horrible storm, and Jesus rebuked it, and the storm stopped instantly. Great story for the ship. How many know that storm wasn't just over the ship? That storm was all around. What would it be like if you're going through a horrible storm, you're wondering if a tornado's coming, and instantly that storm stops? And Jesus isn't with you. Would you not be thinking, what was that? Wow. Okay, that, that is crazy. What just happened? Um, if you look at the story of Mark chapter 4, let me just take you there just for a second. You don't have to turn there if you don't want. But he's talking about being on the storm. And the very next thing he does is when they land on shore, he casts a demon out of a guy, and the whole town comes to experience him. Why does the whole town come to experience him? I think the whole town knew the storm just quit. And even though it doesn't say it here, if you were on a ship and the storm just quit and you land on shore, people are talking. Did you see that storm that just quit? Absolutely. We were on a boat. I know. Why did it quit? Well, that guy right there just said, be quiet. <laughs> Do you think that story didn't go out? Do you think they just stopped that story when they landed on shore? They didn't mention it. The people on the shore, did you, were you out there on that ship when the storm hit? Yeah. Did it stop? Yeah. Why do you think so? Well, no, you don't think they tell these stories? Do you think that had an impact on what was about to happen? You know, don't just put these stories in little, all by themselves. These stories interact with each other. The whole town. Now he's going to cast out a demon. Now he knows he stopped storms. What does the city say? You're too much for us. You got to go. This is way more than we can handle. This guy stopped a storm. This guy cast out a demon out of a guy. We're all fearful. Can you just leave? This is, whoa, we don't even know what's going on. Okay? Make sense? 
Any questions? Is that, is that, any questions about that? So God can use our storms. God can use our storms. Even when it's hopeless, Paul doesn't give up hope because he doesn't want to be rebuked by Jesus and say, where's, where's your faith? People, that, we got to battle fear. We got to step in to the cable cars that's there. We lost all hope. Verse 21, no, uh, back in Acts chapter 27. Verse 21, no one had eaten for a long time. Finally, ca Paul called the crew together and said, men, <laughs> I love this. Paul is not about above rubbing it in their face. Man, you should have listened to me in the first place. What <laughs> first line out of it. What a spiritual man. <laughs> I told you we shouldn't have left. <laughs> and remember, the boat's going like this. <laughs> I told you we shouldn't have left. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. That's a huge thing for Paul. Because when Paul first was going off on the ship, what did he say? The reason we shouldn't leave. What's going to happen? We're going to die. We're going to die if we go. Now what does he say? None of us are going to die. None of, and he goes further than that. Look what he says. He, he said, um, courage, none of you will lose your life even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God to whom I belong. Why would he say that? The angel of the God to whom I belong. Remember what I said about the ship? Can we go back to the picture of the ship? Yes. They were worshiping a God over the ship. And what he's saying is that's not the God that's going to save us. The God I belong to is going to save us. All right? He is literally going to warfare over the God that's over that ship. And every ship has them. You've seen old pictures and old movies of it where there's always a a bust or something of somebody in front of ships. It's a God. It's always a God. And he's saying, the God I serve is going to save us. Guys, this is so key. It, boy, if we could learn this, this would be phenomenal. When the world is flipping upside down and storms are all around us, it is really easy to watch CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News, and, oh, I need updates and stuff. But how much better would it be to get away with God and say, what are you doing in the middle of this? God, you're doing something. Because how many know God's always acting? He's never reacting. He's always acting. He's always doing something. I tell you, fear, fear and anxiety. You watch the news too much. Fear and anxiety will consume you. It'll consume you. You know, our lives, everything. There's something that's going wrong. Everything wants to kill you. I, I used to eat the food in my refrigerator. Now I can't open it without every piece of food in there saying, I want to kill you. You know, all of it's bad. How many know that, you know? Eat margarine instead of butter. Now margarine will kill you. We're back to butter. and Now it, milk's gone, and it's almond stuff. You know, when we're drinking almond stuff, I don't even know what that is. But, that, you know, that's what we're drinking anymore because milk kills you. How many know? Cows are killing us. Meat's killing us. So just eat chicken, but E. coli is killing the chicken. That's killing us. <laughs> Man, the only safe place anymore is Culver's, people. <laughs> That's it. It's our only hope. <laughs> so it, how important it is, guys, how important it is to be able to get away. And God, what are you doing in the middle of the storm? Notice the storm didn't quit when he was praying. But he got a hold of God and said, God, what are you doing in the middle of this? Why would he, what, what is he praying? God promised he was going to Rome. He's on a ship that's going to sink. So how would you pray? Help me out here. You have a promise. You have a situation. How would you pray? Who has the microphone? Because I know Wesley had to leave. I need someone to tell me how you would pray in this situation. You have a promise, and you have a situation that looks like the promise isn't true. His promise is you're going to Rome. The situation is the ship is sinking, and we have no idea where we are for 12 days we have no idea where we are. How would you pray in that situation? I need someone to say how they would pray. Help me out. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. My wife will come with the microphone. Probably just pray that you could remain faithful and follow what you've been told and trust in his promises versus 
what's exactly in front of you. That's good. That's good. God, just help me be faithful. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and here's a promise. Help me to trust this. Anybody else? Anybody want to add to that? I'm looking for someone that would just say, help. <laughs> That's probably how I would do it. <laughs> What's going on? Where's that promise? <laughs> Paul does say this um, in the Bible. I think it's Philippians. How do you encourage somebody? I don't think he's just praying. He said, how do you encourage each other with a psalm, hymn, spiritual psalm? Remember, he's not the only guy on there. Who else is on there? Luke and this other guy whose name I can't pronounce. There's three believers on there. And if this is the same Paul that was in Philippi when he was whipped, what did they do when he was in the Philippian jail and he was whipped? They started to worship too. Let me tell you, nothing will battle fear greater than worship. Change your focus. God, you're the God. You're God. I'm focused on you. You're God. So the, I think these three are singing songs and worshiping. And it's not like, hey, nothing's going to happen. They're doing it intentionally to encourage them. You know, Luke's sitting there, man, are we going to die? Paul, no, man, there's a promise. we got to trust. Let's sing, God, you keep your promises. All your promises are yay and amen. They're encouraging each other. Okay, these guys aren't superhumans. They're encouraging each other. That's why the church has got to come together. We got to encourage each other. Man, you, you're going to make it. What if it goes down? Even if it goes down, man, boom, this is our promise. It's up to God whether he keeps it. I'm trusting God. You know, I'd rather die trusting his promise. You promise I go to Rome and I still died. That's up to you. But I'm going out believing the promise. We got to have that. We got to have, how many got to pray for that? Because I'm not there. Okay, a couple of hands agreed I'm not there. That's good. How many know you're not there either? <laughs> God, get us there. Just get us there. I love that. And what happened when he was praying that? He came out and said, my promise is true. And then I love this. God's going to get me to Rome. And what did God say? And he's going to spare all your lives too. People, do not doubt that where you work, there's a blessing on where you work and live because you're a child of God. We can pray, God, I love you and spare everybody around me too. Spare them too. That's a promise. And God will do it because we're his kids. Okay, we're his kids. It's just like, yeah, bring them along. And Paul said, not only is he going to spare me, he's sparing all of you. I love that. So wherever you work, your place of work is blessed because you're there. Wherever you are, your work is blessed. Your neighborhood's blessed. People you talk to are blessed. Now, you don't have to rub it in their face and say that. You know, you're blessed because I love God. You know, they won't take that real well. But they'll know. They'll know. You know what the Bible says? Peter says, on the day Christ returns, they'll give glory to God because of your life. Yeah, you are right. I saw it in this person's life. <laughs> Isn't that an incredible promise? They will glorify God when he returns because of your life. Is it worth living for God? That all your neighbors, all your coworkers will say, yeah, you are right. It doesn't say they'll become believers. It will say, you are right. I saw Kim's life. He was a believer. You're right, God. That's how we have to live. And then not only that, he tried to encourage them. Guys, we're all going to live. But then he said this, but the ship will be wrecked, okay? That's it. The ship's going down. That's day 12. Day 13, if you were a, a sailor and Paul, now they're starting to listen to Paul. Before, they didn't listen to him. This is day 13. What are you looking for? Paul just said, we're going to be saved, but the ship's going to be wrecked. What are you looking for on day 13? <laughs> Where are we going to crash? Okay, we are going to ram it. And so they're trying to do their sailor thing. The Bible said they lower the anchors. They're trying to slow down the speed of the ship. So if it hits something, it hits it slower. How many know there's less damage if you hit something in your car at 10 miles an hour than 30? They're trying to slow the ship down. And they, they lower the anchors. Day 14, they start taking measurements. How do they take measurements? You have an anchor. You lower the rope until the... There's slack in the rope. You bring it up and measure it. And then you lower it, and there's slack in the rope, and you find out there's less slack in the rope. What does that mean? The ground's coming up. We're getting more shallow. Okay, we're headed toward land. They have no idea. They, they drove for 14 days with no road signs, no anything, no city signs. They're just driving for 14 days. They don't know what state they're in. They don't know where they're at. 
14 days later, they just know it's getting shallow and we're getting toward shore. So the sailors, what do they try to do? They're going to abandon ship. If they're going toward shore and they're on a big ship that can't make it to shore, what makes sense? Go on the small ship that can go to shore. The sailors are smart. They start lowering that small ship. Paul comes up and says, if the sailors don't stay with us, we're all dead. We need sailors. I don't know how to steer a ship. Okay? I don't know how to do it. We, they have to stay. The Romans are now listening to Paul all the time. The Roman guards, they cut that boat and toss it over. So now they don't even have the little ship. They only have the big one. They can't go to shore. Ugh. And it's getting closer and closer to shore. And then Paul comes up with this, verse 33. As the day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You've been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks. How many have ever been that worried? I've never been that worried. I've always been able to eat. Please eat something for your own good. And look at this next promise. For not a hair of your head will perish. The first time he promised them, you guys are going to live. How many know this is a whole nother? You can live with like broken arms and legs. What does Paul say now? <laughs> Not even a hair. How can he get that? Where did that come from? Remember, he has the teachings of Jesus memorized. What did Jesus say about our hair? Yeah. I have it all numbered. God know, God's got it numbered. You don't have to worry. Okay? God's got it numbered. He knows what color it is. We've got this. And we're going to make it to shore. He's just quoting Jesus again. We're going to make it to shore. All right? There's the promise of salvation. What happens on the ship? The ship hits a sandbar. The waves are pounding the size of the ship so bad, big boards start breaking off. They have to abandon ship. Some that know how to swim, swim. Some that don't know how to swim, hold on to boards and let the waves toss them all over. Okay, and they're getting tossed over. One thing we do know is that every single one of them make it to shore. Why is that so incredible? They're on a little island called Malta. Malta is known in storms for its riptides. Who knows what a riptide is? It's when there's huge waves coming in, the water piles up, and so what it will do is it will form a channel of a very strong tide going back out. You know, the water's going this way, so there'll be a strong tide putting it out. Maybe you've heard of this. Uh, people that get caught in riptides in the ocean and it carries you, it can carry you a mile or two out before it dissipates. There are huge riptides. We got people just holding on. Not one of them hit a riptide. Every one of them make it to shore. This is interesting. We know God's going to save us. I don't know if the way you think God's going to save you is holding on to a log in the middle of a horrible storm. The storm's still happening. This doesn't look like salvation. Because you know what, people? Sometimes God's salvation doesn't look like what we want. How many have ever prayed for something and God answers it a little different? Yeah, this isn't exactly how I wanted the answer to come. But God got every one of them to shore. Okay? So it starts to break apart. One last thing happens. When it breaks apart, the soldiers say, we got to kill all the prisoners. We can't afford for them to escape. The commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he stops him. <laughs> no, man. This is, these are the guys that didn't listen to Paul, and now they're sitting there. No, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. And so everybody, the last line, everyone escaped safely to shore. All right? So holding on to a plank doesn't look like salvation, but God's faithful to his promise. God's faithful to his promise, people. Boy, we got to hold promises. Don't give up on promises God shared for you. I know some of you guys have been praying for years. When is this going to happen? When's it going to come forth? And it, sometimes maybe we miss it because it's not answering the way we thought. But God is faithful about his promises. Cast out fear, God. Step into fight. I don't want to be a man of flight. Step into fight. God, cast out fear. Help me to just move forward. I just believe you. Even when the ship's breaking apart, your promises are still true. People, let's just pray. God, give us the faith 
to believe you even when the promises fall apart. So I'll go, let's just pray that for a moment. We're going to go into worship, and then we're going to pray what we talked on tonight. God, thank you. Thank you, God.